Good afternoon, everyone. All right, just a few things and we'll get to your questions. Uh, tomorrow, Secretary Austin will depart for Germany where he and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, will host and convene another session of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group at Ramstein Air Base. And as I highlighted earlier, the contact group has been instrumental in identifying, synchronizing, and ensuring delivery of the military capabilities the Ukrainians need to defend their homeland against Russian aggression. The Secretary and the Chairman look forward to meeting with defense leaders from the approximately 50 nations that comprise this important group dedicated to Ukraine's self-defense. Prior to his arrival at Ramstein, Secretary Austin will travel to Berlin to meet with the incoming German Minister of Defense, Boris Pistorius. Separately, more than 600 National Guardsmen, soldiers, Marines, and airmen are making their way to Northern Michigan this week to take part in the winter portion of exercise Northern Strike 23. The Michigan Army National Guard will host the exercise January 20 through 29th at the Northern Michigan All Domain Warfighting Center. Now in its 10th year, Northern Strike allows active duty, reserve, and guard units to challenge themselves in near Arctic conditions while training to meet the objectives of the DOD's Arctic strategy. Participants will battle wind, snow, and sub-zero temperatures while utilizing skis, snowmobiles, and snowshoes to meet their training objectives. As the National Defense Strategy makes clear, the changing climate is creating new corridors of potential future interaction in the Arctic region, so exercises like Northern Strike help ensure our service members are ready to meet those future challenges head on. Also, I know there's already been some press reporting on this, so I can confirm that in the coming weeks, Secretary Austin will travel to the Republic of Korea and the Philippines to meet with senior government and military leaders in both countries as the United States and these two critical allies continue to bolster our defense partnerships. This upcoming trip is a reaffirmation of our deep commitment to working in concert with allies and partners to chart our shared vision to preserve a free and open Indo-Pacific. And with that, I will take your questions. We'll start with AP. Tara. Hi, Pat. Um, I want to ask about the Ukrainians getting trained at Fort Sill. Have all the Ukrainians arrived? Has training begun? And um, just putting in a request for all of our media organizations, can we get some access, some video, to be able to show uh, what's happening there? Yeah, thanks, Tara. On the latter point, um, we are certainly aware of the requests uh, for media access and uh, are in communication with the, the Army on that front, so we'll keep you updated. Uh, training has begun, uh, as we've talked about before, um, that, that training will last for several months uh, and train uh, upwards of 90 to 100 Ukrainians on uh, use of the, the Patriot missile system. And so uh, those, uh, those troops have arrived at Fort Sill and have begun their training. Thank you. Jenny. Thank you, sir. Um, I have two questions. Uh, South Korea and the United States have agreed to uh, conduct an extended deterrence exercise next month to counter a possible North Korean nuclear attack. Is it actually a plan, I mean, joint plan and joint execution using the United States nuclear assets? Uh, so, uh, in terms of exercises, I don't have anything to announce. I'd encourage you to talk to USFK. They could provide you any details. As you know, we don't typically announce ex certain exercises uh, well in advance. Um, and when we do those exercises, of course, uh, we do that in close consultation with our partners, in this case, uh, Republic of Korea. Um, we've also talked about the fact that the United States uh, does provide an extended deterrence capability for our allies like the Republic of Korea and Japan and others in the region. Um, and we will continue to focus on training uh, and making sure that we can be interoperable when it comes to working together. Yeah, is it include the TTX, like the tabletop exercise? Again, yeah, I'd refer you to USFK. Okay. I don't have well, any other details. Uh, last weekend, the United Nations Command released the photos of B. B-29 bombers bombing North Korea Pyongyang 72 years ago. At this point, does this uh, circumvent the U United States, uh, I mean, extended deterrence strategy? I'm sorry, Jen, I don't, I don't understand the question. Can you ask that again? Because last weekend, the UN uh, command released the photos of 
B-29 bombers were bombing the North Korea's Pyongyang, I mean, 72 years ago, Korean War. Uh, at this point, why they released this in this time, it's, it kind of does the, uh, circumvent the U.S. extended deterrence strategy. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything on that. I'd have to refer you to the U.N. on that. Sorry. Thank you. Carla. Um, thanks. Uh, ANP is reporting that the um, Prime Minister of the Netherlands has said that they're going to send a Patriot missile defense system to Ukraine. He's here in Washington. Can the Pentagon confirm that that's happening? Uh, and then I have one other follow-up. Yeah, I cannot. I'd have to refer you to the Netherlands to talk about that. Okay, thank you. And then separately on Afghanistan, there's been an Afghan commando detained at the border. Uh, special forces fought alongside, not directly with U.S. troops, but alongside U.S. troops. Is the Pentagon concerned that he could potentially be deported back to Afghanistan? Yeah, so uh, I'm not able to talk about individual cases as it, as it relates to um, the, the border and any type of uh, Customs and Border Patrol activity. I'd refer you to DHS on that. Certainly, we've talked about in the past when it comes to our Afghan allies and those that we fought alongside, the department is, is supportive of any efforts that we can make to ensure uh, that we're taking appropriate care. Of those is people. The Pentagon intervening in this case in any instance with. I, I don't have any uh, information on that. Uh, again, on on a on a border case, I'd refer you to DHS, and they can provide you the the latest. Thank you. Let me go to Laura. Um, just back to the Patriot training. I'm wondering, since there will be at least one more Patriot battery coming from Germany, is there going to be another tranche of 90 to 100 Ukrainian forces training at Fort Sill? Is that going to be part of another tranche in a couple months once this is finished, or are they going to be more forces coming to train at the same time? Yeah, How's so, that going? Sure. So as of today, this is the only tranche, but of course we'll continue to, to keep that dialogue open. Uh, and certainly Fort Sill has the capability and the capacity to train uh, many different nations, obviously, on, on Patriot. So uh, that's that's something that we'll continue to, to take into account. But as of right now, this is the group that's coming through to train on the U.S. Patriot that we're providing. So, so if I could follow up, then how is that going to work when there are potentially two Patriots in Ukraine, but only 100 guys that... So you're talking about them. a German-provided Patriot. Yeah. And so really, the Germans, uh, that's a question for them in terms of what their game plan is in terms of training on that system. Again, we will stay open in terms of talking with the Germans and others on how we can best provide support and training to the Ukrainians. But your question was whether or not there will be another group coming in through Fort Sill, and I'm telling you right now, I'm not aware at this time of another group coming through. Thanks. Thank you. Two, two questions. One, a quick follow-up to that. Will Secretary Austin bring that up with, with Boris Pistorius in the meeting in just a couple of days? Is that... Uh, on the agenda. And second, is the Defense Department considering giving back pay and or reinstatement to service members separated for refusing the COVID vaccine? Is that something DOD is actively exploring? Yeah, so in terms of the Secretary's conversations with his uh, German counterpart, uh, we will be sure to issue a, a readout, of course, uh, afterwards. Um, you know, without a doubt, I know that the Secretary will communicate the United States' appreciation uh, for the strong support that Germany has provided to Ukraine and the strong support that we expect that they will continue to do. Um, in terms of, of um, back pay, uh, you're talking specifically on COVID vaccination? Yeah. Um, what I would tell you is right now, uh, we are not currently pursuing back pay to service members who are uh, dismissed for refusing to take the COVID vaccination. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Um, there's been increasing reports lately about parts made by U.S. and Western companies being found inside Iranian drones, drones being used against Ukraine's military. Is this something Under Secretary for Policy Dr. Call and others discussed um, in meetings with Ukrainian officials yesterday leading up to the contact group meeting? And is this going to be a topic of discussion during the meeting at the end of the week? Yeah, so uh, we did issue a readout of the meeting, which I think provides a, a, an overview of the discussion. Uh, clearly, the, the main emphasis is, was on Ukraine security assistance needs and what we can do uh, to continue to support them. When it comes to technology transfer issues, this is really a whole of government uh, effort of which the DOD does play some role, uh, but I don't have any more specifics in terms of the substance of those conversations to provide. 
Madam Chair, um, what DOD's role in the Biden administration's new task force to address um, its products being resold? Is there anything you can share about what your role is there and whether or not you'll be investing more resources or hiring more people to better track or monitor where your parts end up if they are going to be in weapons then used against Ukraine? Yeah, let me take that question and we'll get you a detailed response. Thank you. Liz? Hey, thanks. To follow up on Carla's question a little bit, um, so this case is specifically uh, regarding Abdul Wasi Safi. He's a former Afghan commando. Um, is the Defense Secretary aware of this case? Uh, the, the Secretary follows a lot of activities that are happening around the country. Um, and so, again, we've seen these press reports, but I don't have anything further to provide. Okay. So multiple lawmakers on both sides of the aisle have called for uh, President Biden to pardon him. Would, if the defense secretary is aware of the case. Would he uh, speak with President Biden about that? Uh, I'm not going to get into the privileged discussions between the president and the secretary. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, does Secretary Austin feel that Afghan commandos trained by the U.S. Um, should be able to seek asylum in the U.S.? I think we've been very clear uh, that we're supportive of efforts by the U.S. government to ensure that those who fought alongside us are appropriately taken care of, uh, and so we'll continue to work with the interagency on that effort. Thank you. Ma'am, and then I'm going to go to the phone. Um, just following up on the, the back pay for troops, that was a lawful order at the time, so is there a concern that back pay or reinstatement could set a precedent? Um, well, again, what I would say is um, right now, uh, you know, we do not, um, we are not pursuing uh, as a matter of policy back pay for those who refused the, the vaccine. Um, at the time that, that, uh, that those orders were refused, it was a lawful order. And so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Let me go to the phone real quick. Yeah. Not currently pursuing back pay. Does is this a final decision, or is there a possibility that this could be explored in the future? Yes, yeah, so I'm not going to speculate about what the future uh, might portend. Just just last week, a spokesman told me that this was something that you were exploring. That was only a couple of days ago. So I can I can tell you that right now we're not currently pursuing back pay. Thank you. Let me go to the phones here real quick. Jeff Shogel, tax, task and purpose. Uh, thank you. Uh, last week, a spokesman was asked about back pay and said, quote, regarding the back, back pay, uh, the department is still exploring this and will provide its views on legislation on this nature at the appropriate time and through, appropriate, through the appropriate process. So what has changed since Friday? So thanks, Jeff. Uh, so again, uh, today, as a matter of policy, we're not currently pursuing back pay to service members who refused uh, to take the COVID vaccine. Uh, if and when there are any updates to provide, we'll be sure to do that. Thank you. Let me go to uh, Kimberly Signal. Hi, sir. Thanks for your time today. I wanted to follow up on last week's bilateral meeting with the Japanese Minister of Defense, Hamada, and if the talks with the Secretary addressed how the U.S. and Japan will collaborate further as far as integration of command and control, C2, or even on a JADC2 level. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kimberly. Uh, so we'll certainly have more details to provide in the days ahead. Uh, the, the discussions were uh, an opportunity for the, the two leaders to really uh, look at how we can advance our relationship and modernize the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. And so our two staffs will work together uh, to, to do exactly what you highlight. Uh, talk about the specifics about how we can uh, increase cooperation and, and bolster interoperability when it comes to things like command and control uh, and interoperability. Thank you. Uh, let me do one more for the phone here. I'll come back in the room. Uh, JJ Green. Thank you, General, for taking this question. A number of uh, sources and um, people that are observing Russia, Moscow, say that it appears as though Moscow is taking several defensive steps in and around the city. And there have been a number of think tanks and um, Western intelligence agencies talking for months about Russia possibly making this a wider war or a more conventional conflict. What has the Pentagon seen and noted in terms of Russia's posture right now? Thanks, JJ. And just to clarify, around which city did you say? Moscow. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't have any comments to provide in terms of uh, Russian internal defense around Moscow. I, I think uh, as we look at the battlefield in Ukraine, uh, we've seen, for the most part, Russia essentially dig in along the forward line of troops, uh, with the exception, of course, being in the vicinity of um, Bakhmut uh, and Solidar, of course. Um, you know, and I, and I have seen press reports talking about uh, Russian efforts to strengthen some of their air defenses um, based on uh, mysterious explosions that happen at air bases in their country. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to have anything to provide on that. Thank you. All right, let me go back to the room, Tom, and then we'll go to Nancy. Thanks, General. Uh, what information do you all have, if any, on the missile that struck uh, in uh, over, the, over the weekend in Ukraine that killed 40 people? There have been some reports that it was a hypersonic missile. Can you shed any light on that, please? Thanks. Yeah, so I don't I don't have any uh, detailed reporting on uh, the specifics other than to say, again, we do know that Russia launched a very heavy salvo uh, of missiles um, from aircraft, from uh, naval vessels uh, and from land uh, against Ukrainian uh, civilian infrastructure and civilian targets over the weekend. I think, again, it just highlights uh, the nature of this conflict uh, and the uh, lack of of um, civility on the part of, of Russian forces when it comes to targeting civilians. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. Um, I want to follow up here. Answer to Tara, please, on um, the training at Fort Sill and media coverage. You said that OSC had been in contact with the Army about allowing U.S. media to cover the training. I'd like to understand what precisely is the concern about the coverage around that training, and have there been any restrictions placed on the Army or DOD to allow reporters to cover that training? So again, we continue to talk uh, with the Army uh, about what options may exist. Um, and, and again, um, we'll come back to you as quickly as we can. Some of the things that we need to take into account in particular for the Ukrainians is one, recognizing that they're there to train. There are certain uh, operation security considerations that we need to make sure we've taken into account, um, recognizing that these individuals will go back to the battlefield and they certainly have a say on that as well. Um, but again, um, we will try to see what we can do and come back to you. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is it a question then, well, and I, if I could actually first, have there been any restrictions placed on DOD or the Army? Uh, I would far? say we're still in discussions in terms of, of how we might be able to accommodate those requests. So th right now the now I will say I will say that in the past, uh, when there has been training, there have been restrictions placed in terms of visual imagery, right? Things that could potentially identify these folks who have to go back to Ukraine, who have family members in Ukraine, and so trying to be sensitive to those kinds of things um, certainly has been something that we've taken into account, just like we would for any significant operation. So is the discussion then around how to make this happen or whether to make this happen? The discussion is how to make it happen. So we can anticipate then that at some point we'll be able to see um, this and cover it. We'll keep you updated. Thank you. Rio. Oh, thank you. Uh, last week, the CSIS released a report on the result of the war game simulations on the, on the Taiwan Strait contingency. The main conclusion uh, is that the Chinese invasion would fail, but would result in heavy casualty among the U.S. and allies forces. I wonder if the, their conclusion is consistent with the Pentagon's war games in general. Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to comment on the CSI exercise. I'm certainly aware of it. Uh, more broadly speaking, we've been very clear, uh, as you know, this has also been included in the national defense strategy on the challenge uh, that conflict in uh, the Indo-Pacific as it relates to Taiwan would be. And so as a defense department, we recognize China as the pacing challenge. We continue to do what we can to ensure that we can deter and prevent conflict, but if necessary, uh, that we would fight and win. Thank you. Joe. Thanks. Uh, General, the um, uh, former U.S. Army Europe Commander uh, Ben Hodges tweeted recently you know, that the U.S. should now be providing Ukraine with attackums, gray eagles, uh, small diameter bombs uh, to deny Russia the use of logistics hubs in Crimea and in, in uh, Russia and Belarus. The, U.S. recently crossed the threshold in sending armored vehicles um, to help Ukraine take back territory. 
What's the Defense Secretary's view now on sending precision weapons with ranges of as much as 300 kilometers? Yeah, well, I, th I think Secretary Austin has been very clear that we continue to maintain an active and ongoing dialogue with our Ukrainian partners, with the international community, on what are Ukraine's most urgent needs when it comes to the battlefield uh, and the current situation there. And so going into, for example, the contact group this week, He'll have the opportunity to have those discussions with his Ukrainian counterpart uh, and with our other allies and partners around the table to do exactly that. What are the kinds of things that Ukraine needs to be able to defend themselves and also take back their sovereign territory? So uh, as we have new announcements to make, we'll certainly be sure to pass those along. Has there been any movement on that conversation or has it been largely in the same place as it's been? Uh, well, I think that's a matter of perspective, right? So, I mean, if you if you look at this campaign in its totality, if you would ask that question one month into the campaign, uh, so it, it's relative, right? We're going to continue to adapt and evolve uh, and, and tailor that assistance based on the situation on the ground uh, and based on the capabilities that we can get there to them quickly. So, thank you. Tara. I just have a follow-up on the Patriots. How much of the training will be focused on maintenance and will there be any external support su provided, like additional maintenance support provided by the U.S., additional spares? Are the Ukrainians going to be responsible for keeping the system operational on the ground? Uh, so in, in terms of the maintenance, I, I'd refer you to the Army for a more granular uh, level of detail. I would tell you that uh, maintenance will be an aspect, operations and maintenance will be an aspect of the training. Um, and in terms of maintenance writ large when it comes to the capabilities that we are providing on the battlefield. Um, one, of the, one of the techniques that we've used, as you know, is essentially telemaintenance, right? So remote maintenance capabilities. So that will be something that we will continue to provide to the Ukrainians, uh, not only on the Patriot system, but on a variety of systems as they are employed in the battlefield. Thanks very much. I would just second Nancy's comments too on the, I think it's an important image to get out there of this partnership between the U.S. and Ukrainians on this system, because there's been so much interest. Sure. No, completely understand. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, different uh, changes up a little bit. Can, does the Pentagon have any concern that South Africa is hosting naval exercises next month with Russia and China in the Indian Ocean? Yeah, I've seen the press reports. I mean, South Africa, of course, is a sovereign country. They can choose uh, to exercise with whom they want. Um, so I don't have any particular comment on that other than to say, you know, we do appreciate our defense uh, partnership with South Africa uh, and we'll continue to seek opportunities to, to work alongside them and to further bolster that relationship. You're concerned that if they're working with us and then they're working with Russia, that there might be some sort, you know, there might be some concern about you know, sharing information or technology that we might share with them? Well, again, I think two things there. One, um, there are you know, to put this into context, there are a lot of countries that maintain a security or defense relationship with Russia. Uh, again, that's a sovereign decision for individual countries to make. Uh, many of those nations who have in the past purchased uh, Russian-built or Soviet-era equipment, uh, so it stands to reason that they may maintain some type of relationship. Uh, from a security cooperation standpoint, certainly from the, from the U.S. perspective, uh, I think that the types of security assistance the United States provide to include capabilities uh, is, is much more dependable uh, and also um, maintained and something that we continue to, to, to discuss with various partners and allies around the world on would they, uh, should they choose to, to purchase those kinds of systems, we're certainly all ears. Uh, India being a great example. Thank you. Sir. Hi, Peter Martin from Bloomberg. Uh, my colleagues reported that uh, the Pentagon is struggling to reestablish mill-mill ties with China, and I wondered if you have any comments on that. Uh, I think we're always open to uh, maintaining the, those open lines of communication with China. We recognize the fact uh, that, that China is going to continue to operate in that region for obvious reasons, and we want to do everything we can to reduce uh, potential miscalculation. So uh, from a United States standpoint, from a DOD standpoint, uh, we certainly will continue to be available to uh, to communicate with our Chinese counterparts uh, at a multiple uh, level, uh, multiple echelons. Thank you. Okay, time for a few more. Kasim. Uh, General, uh, the DC, uh, DSCA and State Department have sent the decision for the sale of F-16s to Turkey to for tier to be at the Congress. Could you tell us how important this potential sale 
is for the mill-to-mill -mill relations that have strained over the course of the years for several on several issues. Yeah, thanks, Kasim. Uh, so recognizing the fact that that's uh, before Congress for consideration, uh, you know, I, I defer to the, the DSCA to talk about the current status of it. Certainly when it comes to the bilateral relationship between the United States and Turkey, uh, we've always said that Turkey is an important partner, an important ally, uh, and so we'll continue to work closely with uh, Turkey's leaders on, on how we can bolster that relationship and ensure uh, that our mutual defense needs are, are considered. Thank you very much. All right, Joe. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while, Joe. Kasim's question, uh, can we say, is it fair to say that the deal, uh, the F-16 deal with Turkey is kind of related to the F-35 deal with Greece? Do you see any link between both deals? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to necessarily connect uh, the, those two issues. I, I'd refer you to DISCA in terms of the, the current status of the deals. Um, certainly we have um, a relationship with Greece and a relationship with Turkey, both of which we value. You might, you might be aware that there is a strong opposition on the Hill vis-a-vis -vis the F-16 deal to Turkey. Uh, is there any message from the Pentagon to the Congress in regards to this matter? Uh, and that's a congressional decision to make. I'm not going to stand at the podium and, and tell Congress what they should or should not do. Again, uh, the United States and Turkey share a, uh, an alliance. Uh, and they're an important partner, not only in the region, but around the world. And so I'll just leave it at that. Courtney. Just a couple of quick um, um, follow-ons from earlier. I think when Liz from Fox asked about um, the Afghan service member who was detained at the border, she asked specifically if Secretary Austin, and you said we are aware of the press report. So I just want to be clear, is Secretary Austin, he's aware of this case, and is it fair to say he's like he's tracking it, he's following this specific, this specific case? Uh, I don't have an answer to that question. And then on the COVID vaccine, I just also want to be clear on that because you keep saying that the, the DOD is not pursuing it, but does that mean that there's no review or anything that's ongoing about potentially paying back pay or are you saying that the issue... Yeah, so is as a matter of policy, we're currently not pursuing back pay. Um, and then my last one is just, I'm wondering if there's, there's been some reporting um, about, on social media mainly, about a, a delegation of Russian military officials who were in Syria um, meeting with some of the, um, the autonomous administration and um, leadership. And I'm wondering if you, if that's anything that you have a comment on, if you're aware if there's any U.S. military component to this meeting or anything you can share on it. Yeah, I'd, I don't. I just mentioned two other countries, but, <laughs> but I'm just curious yeah. if there's any Pentagon reaction to it. Again. No, I continue to monitor, but I don't have anything to provide on that. Okay, we do just a couple more. Let me get a couple other folks in the room here. You and then you. Thank you, General. General, there is uh, some recently uh, reports about that Turkey uh, are planning to do a new operation in north of uh, Syria. Have you aware about that uh, things? And uh, do you still think there is a concerns? about any military operations in this country, in the north of this country. Thank yeah, you. we've been very clear uh, that, that any type of ground offensive into northern Syria uh, could further destabilize the region and negatively impact the defeat ISIS mission. Uh, and so we've communicated that to our, our Turkish allies, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, in your assessment, thank you. In your assessment, how how do the British tanks? Um, what what impact will British tanks have on the ground in Ukraine? Uh, well, broadly speaking, and again, I'll allow uh, the UK to speak for itself in terms of the the capabilities that it that it may or may not provide. Broadly speaking, again, as an international community, any type of capability that we're able to provide to Ukraine to assist them in their efforts to defend their territory, uh, and and. Uh, be prepared to take back territory, I think is a good thing. Uh, certainly, as we've talked about before, uh, having uh, armor type of capabilities gives them a, a another capability to employ on the ground in order to change the equation on the battlefield, especially as we've seen uh, some of those lines become static. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, it's up to Ukraine on how best to employ those capabilities. The only other thing I'd say on that is the capabilities they've been provided, they've employed to great effect. 
Thank if you very I may, much. If, now that our allies are sending or considering sending tanks to Ukraine, how does this change the U.S. Posi position on sending American tanks to Ukraine? Uh, so, again, I don't have anything to announce. I think we've been very clear when we do uh, have something to announce. Uh, we'll be providing the, the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, as you know, uh, which, again, is an armor capability. Uh, and so, um, you know, when and if we have something new to announce, we will. Thank you all very much, everybody. Appreciate it.